What would you do if a seven foot tall man bear rat was hell bent on consuming you and your group of friends? Not only is it faster than you, but also possesses claws several inches in length and a bloodthirst that can only be quenched by the sweet, sweet nectar of the human circulatory system. If you answered with, use the power of friendship to overcome it, well, that's a strange answer, but likely it's not going to be very successful. Because in today's episode, we have a group of friends who, get this, actually act like friends. This is like the first time I've ever seen this in any B movie, where they actually get a group of people to not act like mortal enemies when they're supposed to be just buddy buddy which as you might imagine makes it that much more difficult for them as they continue to get absolutely shrecked by this animal thing deep in the woods of Connecticut so in today's episode we'll be covering the physiology as well as the possible origins of this creature from the movie animal and I'm about to date myself but it's not the one Rob Schneider was in who gets his organs donated from other animals because even I can't sit through that kind of punishment so two quick things first YouTube's doing a purge right now I've asked them to look into it it's been two weeks since they got back to me so everything's screwed you may have been actually removed from the channel so if you want to check dope if not, don't worry about it. And second, I'm like every other friggin' YouTuber out there right now. I've got a cold that came from nowhere. So if I sound a little weird, that's why. So as per usual, which apparently it rustles the jimmies of some people on this channel, we'll be starting with the actual summary of the movie. Because like most of these movies, I gotta be honest, I'm not even really sure how I'm finding them at this point. But if you haven't seen this movie and want to check it out, I'm actually gonna be honest here. It wasn't bad. And they actually did a good job of making the characters likable and the monster scary enough. So bravo on that. But there'll be a timestamp up on screen or you can head to the chapter bar in order to jump ahead into the breakdown of the thing's physiology and the postulation to what in the name of all that is holy is this thing. For everyone else, let's get to why there is not an Amy in sight and everything is right to take the fight into the night before you get a deadly bite in this episode. And why did I rhyme that? I'm not actually sure. That's just for fun. We open up our story with the scenic woods at night. A group of adults is running from something unseen in the dark. One of them is screaming at Barbara in the background, but she appears to not be doing so well with keeping up with the group. Oh no, I hope she doesn't fall. But alas, she does fall and then gets dragged into the foliage. Her husband tries to go back for her, but there is really no way he's going to help her. Before he can do anything, she's fully dragged under as the rest of the group nopes out of there. So guys, not everyone be a hero at once. We now cut to daylight, as a group of friends are on a back road in Connecticut heading towards some fantastic hiking destination. And I mean, I have to stop here and say, it always starts with hiking, doesn't it? The brother driving asks his sister in the back where the turnoff is, and she says, Holland Creek. Then, like, whimsical music starts playing, which, knowing what I know, is hilarious. Okay, but now we meet Sean in the back. He's got an earbuds and screeches in the car if they are there yet. Like, just take your earbuds out, man. Anyhow, so as they continue their journey before hitting a roadblock and saying, eh, close enough, they find a sign to which Mandy, which is Jeff's girlfriend, like, new girlfriend, I suppose, says that it's there for forest regeneration. Except Jeff knows it's a bunch of malarkey and that they are trying to keep people out while they cut it all down. Although, you know, it might be something else, Jeff, my boy. Maybe paying attention to those signs might be a good thing, though I gotta be honest, when I've been hiking, I pretty much don't pay attention to those signs either. Which, cue in the avid hikers that roast me in the comments now, but come on, bro, you gotta live a little. Signs are really more of suggestions, right? Well, that doesn't matter because the group is saying screw it, just like I usually would. So let's continue on with our nature jaunt. So they all strap in and get ready to go. We now meet Alyssa and Matt as they talk about whatever back of the Jeep. And Matt doesn't seem very outdoorsy, but he's down to clown with it. Whereas Alyssa and Jeff would come out here every year with their dad and mom and hike the area. Sort of like a family vacation sort of deal. Matt is concerned about impressing Jeff and Alyssa's parents, which uh, to all, you know, the young people out there, that's the number one way to never impress anyone's parents. Just let your merits speak for themselves. Don't try to impress people. Anyways, Jeff loads everyone up and again, it may seem like everyone is sort of and with each other right now, but hey, actual human emotions in this movie. Sean tries to start bringing his iPod or phone and now that I'm saying this, I realize it's probably just an iPhone. I am not that old. Jeff tells him not to bring it, but leave it in the car, to which Sean declines saying that he likes mood music. All I'm saying is, bringing a phone into the woods probably is like the absolute move if you're hiking, because who knows? If something goes wrong, you may actually still get signal. So they now all set off to begin their hike. They keep mentioning how the sucker is getting cut down, by the way, like a lot. I hope no animals get disturbed. So we now get to hike through like the wilderness and whatnot, which I have to say, I'm gonna go find this place and hike it because it seems pretty awesome. And we also get a comment from Jeff about how he's leading them near a cave, which is next to a creek. And I've also led a group of friends to a cave near a creek, ignoring signs, and then went into that cave. So I really gotta start remembering these movies. So continuing their hike, Jeff has now lost his shirt. Sean finds the bear mace in a bag just in case, because you never know about bears and as they walk we see a pan by a wolf that has been absolutely destroyed or it could be a coyote it's probably a coyote Alyssa and Jeff then jump into an argument about should they head back Jeff tells her that they've been out further with dad like all the time so she should relax well now the sun is setting so they probably aren't going to you know make it back to the car and while Jeff and Alyssa continue to argue over it Matt goes to take a leak and then ends up finding someone else's bag in the process from the United States Marines and as he checks it out he hears something moving in the distance as they search through the bag they don't really find much but keep walking through the dark Manny and Jeff 
getting a right proper domestic over the hike. And now Mandy is pretty upset as Jeff has basically spilled the spaghetti from his pockets and made them just hike in the night. Sean launches into a ghost story, but really nobody is having it. And they just decide to keep pushing forward as they need to get back to the car or they have to set up camp. They stop to check a map and figure out their location when Mandy sees something in the distance. Finding bloody clothes, she spots something under a rock and then she sees just a mess of gore. Letting out a scream, something in the dark then returns a roar, which I'm not rhyming on purpose. <laughs> Why did I write this this way? Anyways, they all take off running through the woods as they don't know what is following them. Rounding a corner though, they spot something eating something else and making this barking noise. Jeff says that he's going to try to scare it, but bro, you have bear mace. Mace it. But before he can square up on it, it squares up on him and begins to chase the group and appears to be much faster. Sean falls but actually gets picked up by Matt because the group actually likes one another before finally stopping and hiding next to a rock. In the distance, they spot a cabin and figure that this is their best option. Jeff being the leader and appearing to be the most physically capable tells them to turn off their lights and run as fast as they can to this cabin. Mandy finally relents and they agree that Jeff will distract the animal and then meet him at the cabin later. As they make their move, Jeff then turns around and oh lord, it's the swole jeepers creepers monster literally right next to him. It begins tearing into him, making quick work of his abdominal wall before digging into the intestines. Jeff quickly expires as the rest of the group continues to run towards the cabin, realizing that there is really nothing they can do for him at this point. Also get used to this as I would almost bet you a hundred dollars there's no idea you would guess who's going to survive and who's going to get got in this movie. It really just subverts all of your expectations and in a good way not like in the crappy way like in the last of us 2 which was like a 45 hour long cutscene movie approaching the cabin they begin pounding on the doors to be let in but find that it's boarded up people inside then let them in as mandy gets grabbed the people inside light a flare and burn it as it moves around the cabin then attempting to look for a way in which now we meet the rest of the squad the people from the night before sean is able to get on his phone and actually gets a signal and he puts out a call to which he's told 911 will soon be out there and that they need to stay where they are sean's phone ends up dying before he could actually complete the entire task, but he's sure that they will show up. Mandy begins asking the older woman, Vicky, what they're doing out there. She says their car died, and that they were cutting through the woods to try to find a road when this thing outside chased them into the cabin as well. Sean then reports that Alyssa's parents are sending people into the area to look for them, but judging by that thing outside, I mean, stay strapped, man. As many ask how long 911 is going to take, they hear a voice from upstairs, a man named Douglas, who the night before lost his wife. He pretty much has completely and utterly gone into survival mode, but with a hint of doom and gloom. He's upset the others were let in, saying that they have basically, by letting in the second group, have chummed the waters. Carl then says that that thing outside slows down when it's eaten, but they aren't safe here. They need to check the barriers. He says that they were already there when they got there, some new and some way older, meaning that there's been several waves of humans getting got in this cabin. <laughs> Carl also confirms that the thing is trying to find its way in from the outside. It almost appears to be very well informed of the layout of the house. Breaking down furniture, they then go to start fortifying their position. Douglas upstairs is doing nothing to help, because he's lame, and Alyssa goes to start checking on other areas of the house being blocked from the upstairs. Matt comes in to check on her, to which Alyssa says she believes the creature wants them there. Okay, so here's the only part that I was like, uh, okay. She's trying to figure out why this creature wants them there. I mean, food, obviously, but it's clear that the thing is not natural by any means, or at least in the catalog of creatures on the surface of this planet. Matt is like, no, don't do that to yourself. Don't try to understand it. Your big, beautiful brain is just working overtime. Anyways, he just goes on. I mean, why though? Why not understand? understand what it's doing. Like, nobody knows how smart this freaking thing is, but it appears to operate at a higher capacity than most animals. So I think maybe understanding it might be important. Anyhow, it just seemed like a really weird part they added in the movie. Anyways, so Douglas is being useless upstairs and basically acts like he doesn't want to help. But as Matt and Alyssa argue in the kitchen, oh lord, the man bear rat has come back. Attempting to break into the window, they are able to block it out, but it appears at another window before climbing up to the roof and breaking into a room. Carl tells Vicky to grab some fire as they ascend to get the thing out of the house. Opening the door, it was in a smaller room and oh lord he's coming. They keep it behind the door but as they need to put something against the door it begins ripping through it but Sean is able to mace it in the face. Oh finally Douglas has showed up and they are able to push a dresser against the door only after Carl is injured though. Douglas says that they are totally boned if they don't get out of that house. Alyssa comes up with an idea. Take the fortifications from around the house and focus it into one room. That way it's harder to get into. Sean also says 911 is coming they just need to hold out. Douglas ends up scoffing at this and says no way man they really aren't. He called 911 a while back and then nobody showed up. So their 911 calls are likely going unheeded as well. Although people probably may be showing up, it's possible that they're just getting got, which we'll talk about a little later. Sean then asks, all right, Douglas, well then what's your plan if you want to be Mr. Unhelpful? And surprisingly, he's got one, but it's unsurprisingly a terrible plan. He suggests giving the creature something to snack on while the rest of them make a break for the road. A good idea right up until you realize you got to actually snacrifice someone of your own. So the group then declines this plan. Matt has a version of this idea, however.
however, create a diversion. And this turns out just to be a hilariously bad plan. He's going to take off running. Lisa pulls Matt into the kitchen, and I'm not sure what he's basing this on, but he's like, we've seen how big this thing is. That means it's slow. Like, bro, a grizzly bear is huge, and it can run at about 35 miles per hour or 56 kilometers per hour. The fastest human ever so far is Usain Bolt, and he can only run at 27.78 miles per hour or 44.72 kilometers per hour. And even then, the average human sprint speed, it's not really sustainable as it burns through glucose like you wouldn't believe. So, I mean, really, the average person only can get about 15 miles per hour or 24 kilometers per hour. I don't think size has anything to do with it. But anyhow, with this dumb plan in mind, it appears to be the only game in town apart from sacrificing someone, so they begin making preparations. But really, they're just sacrificing Matt, he just volunteered for it. Carl, at this point, agrees to the plan as well, saying he really isn't scared of it anymore. <laughs> okay. So here's the idea. Sean will stay up, up top with binoculars and keep an eye on Carl. Once the thing is trained in on Carl, Matt will slip out the back door with a radio and then haul ass away from the area. Honestly, it's a bold strategy, so let's see if it works out for him, Cotton. Carl begins making his way through the woods with Sean keeping watch. As Carl blows a whistle to attract the thing, you might be noticing that he's not instantly getting attacked. In fact, Sean spots the animal in front of Carl by about 10 yards, but Carl can't see it. But even then, it never begins its attack. While it's focused on Carl, Matt uses this opportunity to take off running. While back inside, Sean thinks it ducked behind a bush because he can't see it anymore, but he thinks it's still there. Immediately on the radio, Matt lets out a scream and a blood-curdling voice saying it's coming. I mean, honestly, man, cue up the Curb Your Enthusiasm music because he probably didn't even get out of view of the cabin and likely still got snatched. But this sends Douglas into a panic as he tries to board up the doors. It's not just Douglas and the three women, so using his stature, he's able to keep them away from the front door before Alyssa runs back into the kitchen to let them in. After getting in, Carl throws a haymaker, knocking out Douglas, which we have all wanted to do since the beginning of this movie. Douglas then wakes up later, tied to some stairs. Douglas proclaims that he did what was necessary, which I sort of doubt that, and he shouts a bunch of nonsense, but nobody really cares. Mandy now goes to talk to Alyssa about what's happening. Alyssa is trying to figure out how to take this creature out. She proclaims that she will kill it, and then they sort of hug it out, as you do. And now Mandy tells Alyssa that she's actually pregnant. Sean then begins to have a meltdown because of his close encounter of the third kind, almost fourth, to be honest. Sean says that he also has to get some stuff off his chest because that's what was going through his mind. He wants to sort of, like, get his regrets out. He talks about Jeff and him having a thing together, which makes Mandy upset, but she doesn't care. She just wants everyone to move on. He's gone, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. Back in the living room, the radio seems to be going off. It appears to be some sort of page as Matt comes over the radio and makes some noise. They realize that he has crawled his way back into the cellar, which ain't good. They decide they need to go down there and actually get him and bring him back up, which turns out to be a pretty bad idea. Carl and the girls go down there, and after Carl has to tell his wife to stay upstairs, he's like, oh yeah, I can take this creature in open combat. No big deal. Ooh, that's not gonna age well. So they find Matt down there, and he's pretty messed up, which by the way, in his state, you might be asking yourself, how did he crawl back? Well, I seriously doubt he did, because the creature is actually waiting for them down there. Carl tackles it, but judging by the spray of blood, that fight did not go too well. So they traded their top player in the game for a barely surviving husk. As Matt lays on the ground, he's clearly going into shock, and if you see someone do this, you need to keep them warm and stop the bleeding, just so you are aware. Also, the old adage was raising the legs to keep blood near the core, but that's apparently no longer necessary. Douglas says Matt is dying, but Alyssa doesn't want to let him go. Douglas says that he can still save them, which is what he wanted to do in the first place. If they leave him there, they can outrun the creature. But judging by what this thing is doing already, I'd have to say they are way underestimating this thing's intelligence. He attempts to convince Alyssa, but she says that she can't do it. But she does have another plan. Open the door, let the thing in, and trap it. Douglas relents and says, yeah, I actually like your idea better. Sean then goes and unties Douglas. Matt at this point is just about to nope out of his mortal coil as Douglas then beats his face in with a piece of wood. Which, how did absolutely nobody see this dude doing this? Okay, so we get this scene. Remember like in Deep Blue Sea when Samuel L. Jackson gives his speech about escaping the sharks and then immediately gets eaten? Same thing here. Douglas starts screaming about how he's willing to do what needs to be done and that he's a survivor. Which, quick tip, if you're in a horror movie, never say that. As he goes to open the door, oddly enough, to throw Matt's body out, he gets attacked and then eaten, giving the group ironically time to run to the cellar and to the kitchen. Alyssa goes and gets the kerosene at this point to set the trap. They begin pouring it all over, which activates the almonds of the animal. As he goes to investigate, Alyssa shuts the door on it, trapping it, and then lighting the room on fire, catching the creature off guard. Seemingly, it drops a few seconds later and that they have won, but have they? No, they haven't. As they go outside, Vicky finds Carl's body and she tries to help him, but he's like puppy chow at this point. We then hear Sean screaming outside in a spray of blood as there appears to be more than just one. Vicky gets stabbed through the guts by the creature as Mandy now begins running with Alyssa. Making their way towards the town, running fast, monsters pass and they're car bound. <laughs> 
Mandy gets super tired and decides to have like this weird moment where she stares at some leaves. At this point, Alyssa gets attacked and she also gets caught. So literally, that entire family lineage is donezo. And if you say to me, you thought Alyssa was not going to be the one that survived, I'm going to have to call you a liar on that one. So Mandy is the last one alive. And as she runs, I was thinking, oh, she's going to get got. Well, she rubs dirt on herself, predator style, to cover her scent. She finally makes it back to the car and gets in. Also, what's funny is when the creature appears at the window, you can actually see the differences in the glass as they change it so that it could break it. So the thing breaks in and then she gets into a game of keep away before getting back into the car, slamming the Jeep in reverse and running over its head, taking it out. Okay, so cars are pretty strong, I'll give you that, but that means that this thing is no stronger than just a regular animal, which means this whole time, rather than building defenses, they could have made like spears and stabbed the creature that came at them. They had the manpower. Hit it with mace, stab it in the face. The best defense is a good offense after all. But freaking Mandy survived the whole thing, which I was actually super surprised about. This isn't like an Amy scenario, like there was nothing wrong with Mandy, but I just did not see her surviving. But as the creature's head was squished, another one comes to check it out, showing that there are likely several of these things. And considering the call it lets out, I'm also guessing that this is sort of a pack hunting technique, meaning probably there's definitely several of them out there. So the first thing we should actually discuss is its physiology. This will give us an idea of what we were dealing with, and with context clues scattered throughout, this is going to clear up some issues that you have probably seen throughout the movie, which means we also need to talk about the actual ecosystem this creature is in, which also gives us a few clues to the fact that this is in no way, shape, or form supposed to actually be where it's currently stalking. This animal has all jet black skin, which covers every inch of its body. Top of that, it appears to have very little body fat, if any at all. This may explain its actual hunting technique of herding people into one area as it needs to eat a lot in order to maintain its metabolism. The skin appears quite leathery, which hints that the creature may actually be using this as a form of armoring in order to protect itself from injuries. And it has a small plume of hair located only on its back, which starts around the top of the shoulders and goes down to the tailbone. So starting with the feet, we see this creature is in fact digitigrade in structuring. However, we see two things. The first is that it is completely comfortable moving on all fours in order to attack prey that is deemed edible, or when checking on another of its own that just got got. What's interesting is it does not appear to have well-defined tarsal digits of its feet, and instead they appear to be either fused together or close to it. Sharp claws exist on the foot potentially for either digging, climbing, or slashing at prey. If the toes do exist in the conventional sense, then it's highly likely there's about three in total. The creature walks on the balls of its feet, giving it a height advantage, but also likely making it quick as kinetic energy is absorbed by its form of Achilles as it allows it to run and then spring forward. I mean, clearly this thing was able to outrun Matt even though he had a head start. Moving up the legs, we see the ankles exist further up, about roughly six to eight inches, even potentially more. The legs continue up, you know, as they should, into muscular thighs with, again, the thick leathery coating covering them, protecting them from damage. Moving into the pelvic region and abdominal region is where we start getting to some interesting features this creature has, which again, may hint at several things about what exactly it is. The pelvis is shaped like that of a common chimpanzee, meaning that it has a more forward tilt rather than the shape of our own, which perfectly keeps our legs underneath our bodies supporting us. What this has done is caused the creature to be able to walk upright at will, but also still highly capable of running on all fours. I severely doubt it chooses a bipedal motion in order to track down prey, considering that we have seen earlier the shredded carcass of a coyote or wolf. It would have to be able to keep up with that animal, which bipedalism would just not offer this ability. In the abdominal region, we see that this creature has the same abdominal muscles that you or I have, but as we move up to the rib cage and thoracic area, the ribs appear much stranger than ours. For instance, while there does appear to be a sternum in place along with ribs that connect to it, there does not appear to be any false ribs. The only difference between false ribs and regular ribs for your information is where they connect or don't connect at all. True ribs connect to the sternum, false ribs connect to another rib higher up, or they might not even connect to anything at all concerning the two bottom ribs or floating ribs just above the pelvis. The rib cage is also quite sizable. Because this is a hunting animal that has to run down its prey, the lungs would need to be large to track down this prey, and likely this is why the creature is so barrel chested. But what's also strange is the rib cage is so large that the pectoral muscles are not well defined and instead are stretched over, giving the creature almost an emaciated look. Moving around to the back, again we see that some hair exists, but its purpose is not fully understood. The general thinking is maybe warmth, but the sparseness of it would not keep this animal very warm, so instead it may act as some form of protection for its spine. Moving down the arms, we see this creature is actually has a fairly similar setup to that of a human, which is pretty strange. The deltoids are quite defined, which if you've seen that picture of that hairless chimpanzee with alopecia, then it's almost similar to that. The muscles in the arm grow rather large as they're used in a walking motion. And this is why I propose that the creature uses quadrupedal locomotion most times as opposed to bipedal. The biceps and triceps, much like the deltoids, are quite large as they act as almost like the thighs of the legs. As we continue down the forearm, it's hard to see in the movie, but the creature actually has several spikes that come out of its forearm tissue, which to my knowledge, no creature on earth typically has this. Then getting down to the fingers, 
fingers and the hands. The hands themselves are not large, but the fingers are massive. Three exist, one of them being really kind of a opposable thumb, making it tridactyl. And each finger is equipped with a claw several inches in length that can be used for slashing at prey, but also likely allows it to clamber and climb as we have seen it do up the side of the cabin, or at least heard it go up the side of the cabin. And now we get to the money shot, the head. This creature has a massive neck, but what's interesting, which we don't see usually, the connection point of the neck in this area for the creatures that spend half the time walking upright and the other half in a quadrupedal locomotion, is typically like, say, in chimpanzees again, or bears, or really any other that goes back and forth between walking styles, the neck connects to the back of the skull, and this allows them to have their head forward and allows them to slouch, which puts them back in a quadrupedal configuration to move. However, with this animal, the neck most definitely attaches at the base of the skull, which is much like that with Homo sapiens, and this explains the head size that we see. The head is massive, with a fairly large cranial cavity for a sizable brain. The skin is completely sucked to the skull, with a depression around the temporal area of the skull, and this would be right above the eyes. Large ridges of bone run around the skull, and a large parietal and occipital lobe of the brain would be feasible due to skull structuring, which are the sides and back of the brain respectively. The interesting thing about these areas being larger than normal, or at least on normal animals, is that the parietal is associated with things like sensation, like touch pressure, and fine motor control. So quills on the head would be interpreted by a large brain area. The temporal lobe is likely larger too, meaning that it is able to interpret sound better and has a larger area dedicated to this. Meaning that likely as soon as the group pulled up in the jeep, these things knew they were there. Then with the huge occipital lobe, information processed coming from the eyes is better and quicker, allowing it to have extremely good eyesight, and judging by the actual eyes themselves being all black, means that they are definitely nocturnal predators. But anyhow, we will explain all this later as to why I believe this creature is much more intelligent than everybody thinks. So there are whiskers like quills at the top of the head again, and these relay information to the brain when they are hunting in confined areas. These may spread out sort of like how the hair on an animal stands up, which allows it to figure out if its head can fit into an area or not. Again, the eyes are jet black, lacking any type of pupil that we can see, meaning that it probably is a very large pupil. Then getting to the mouth, we see the strangest adaptation. The mouth is about roughly one third the size of the skull, requiring powerful biting muscles, which is interesting because we do not see the muscle attachment point that is typically near the cheekbones and temporal area. Instead, they may run to the back of the skull. The bottom teeth are all quite jagged, with the front two being several inches in length. The top teeth seem to not even be placed correctly, with some of them jutting out of the maxilla area where we would expect the nose to be. And speaking of nostrils though, two slits do sit between the eyes, which can be assumed to be the nose, as I'm guessing that's what they are. And the mouth itself cannot fully close, meaning that this animal is used to tearing away meat, tilting its head back, and swallowing whole pieces of its prey. Now, considering it's able to move within the ecosystem of Connecticut, and really Earth, it is an oxygen-based animal, which will give us some clue as to what it might be later on. But speaking of prey, let's discuss its hunting style momentarily to get a good idea of its social structure. The first thing to note is that in a lot of ways, this is an ambush predator. It will be actively waiting for prey to reveal itself, and then corral it to an area at which point it can eat it when it wants to. It is perfectly capable of running down four-legged animals and ripping them apart, and the fastest human, which was Matt's dumb idea, was little to no problem. In fact, despite every human's attempt, this thing just absolutely savages a person. Which now it's time to talk about how hilariously bad humans are built, just as like a complete side thing. So you know this creature goes for the advent, right? Well, that's a pretty good idea of where all of your perfectly contained organs are, and that's really just behind a small flap of skin. So this means that it's actually fairly intelligent, which we again will go into, but did you know when humans started walking upright, it was both awesome for our brains, but horrible for our bodies. Inside of your abdominal area, there is something called the greater omentum. Essentially, it's a fatty membrane. It lays on the muscle interior to it, or interior to the muscle of the abdominal, so when an animal, like, who's four-legged gets an injury to their abdomen, this can actually go into the wound to seal it up and give the body a chance to heal. In humans, however, because we walk upright, this greater omentum cannot properly seal up a hole in the abdominal wall, because it's sort of just like hanging against the abdominal muscle, rather than laying on it. And this is one of those things that our evolution couldn't really account for. We got the ability to have a three pound chemoelectric anxiety meat thing in our brain case because the spine shifted to the base of the skull, but we lost our ability to take a talon to the guts and then walk away. I swear, life is nothing more than mother nature saying, eh, good enough, and then moving on. So anyways, back to the creature's intelligence, we see that this thing, likely because of its meat-based diet, is highly intelligent as the extra protein has allowed the brain to become larger, much like we have seen with our own ancestors when they switched from berries and leaves to also incorporating meat into their diet. We have also seen this intelligence displayed several times. 
The first example is when corralling all humans into an area into one cabin. Carl says the barriers are older and that some are newer, but there was nobody there when they got there, meaning that this is essentially a refrigerator for this animal, keeping humans in one location until they get hungry. The other just absolutely means like everyone should be concerned is the intelligence of when Carl goes outside to distract it. Those things were not fooled at all. The second he stepped outside to get his attention, it knew it was a distraction and was waiting for whoever wasn't the diversion to run so that they could grab them. Now, it's been shown that there are multiple of these things, but it's not surprising that the one in front of Carl disappears and almost gets to Matt immediately. The last example is Matt showing up in the basement. This was a complete trap set forth by these creatures. Matt in that condition could not have dragged himself there. Instead, he was likely placed there by the creature as it waited in the cellar. That's why it didn't outright end him when he was making a run for it, and that's why it didn't end him even though it was in the cellar as well. Because we all know this thing can easily end others, but instead it chose to use him as bait like humans try to do with Carl. And I lied, because we have one more form of intelligence, and that's communicating with one another. We see them constantly barking, which prior to watching the whole thing might be like, oh, well that's weird, but really it's communicating with its pack and other members who may be nearby. Because nobody actually knows how many of these things there are. This communication appears to be more refined, as when you watch the movie, there are different sounds likely indicating different instructions. So I have to say this though, everyone's first bad idea was forgetting what they are. Humans. And what are humans great at? Creating weapons. It's basically our favorite thing to do. We see when the jeep runs this thing over, it's far from invincible. The reality is, it's not much stronger than any other animal, something likened to a bear. But even a bear can be brought down by a wily human under the right conditions. In fact, back in 2007, a man named Chris Everhart, total badass, picked up a piece of firewood after a bear entered his campsite and began attacking his three young sons. He literally beat the 300 pound bear to death. I mean, good lord, alpha chat of the century. So humans hopped up on adrenaline have the capability, even with blunt tools, to end creatures far larger than themselves. But their fate was sealed when Matt convinced Alyssa to not overthink it when they they actually should have probably been absolutely trying to figure out how smart this thing was. Had they realized, you know, I think this thing is acting and moving in a way that would make me think it's not a normal animal, they could have created spears. Again, because the jeep had no problem ending this thing's existence. Considering it does not appear to be much stronger than, again, a bear, and its abdomen is exposed because it does walk upright sometimes, a spear to the gut would have likely done the job. But instead of going on the offensive in some manner, they went full defense, which that just never really works properly. Because as mentioned earlier, the best defense is a good offense. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was the actual origin of this thing. Now, you might have guessed this thing is given no explanation at all, but there are several things happening in the area that may suggest a couple of events could be taking place. First, the forest is being cut down currently. Now, even in this, several likely half-truths exist because of what's found later. Either the forest is really being cut down in large swaths, and this has definitely displaced this animal along with the rest of its kin, which then made it have to branch out to find more suitable areas in which to hunt, or it's just a complete ploy to keep people out. If it's the first option, then this means that these things were always here, but the adaptations this creature has would not say that this is the case. The jet black skin and dark eyes indicate to me that this thing is not native to Connecticut as the angle of the sun would not require this much melanin production. On top of that, if it exists, say, in a cave system and then branched out to hunt, it may have been driven by woods around the cave being destroyed, but again, these adaptations that this creature has does not put it in line with any other creatures, like bears, who might have used the same hunting patterns. The next clue we find as to where this thing may come from is the Marines pack out in the middle of the woods. Now, there are a few bases around Hartford, Connecticut, and because there's also like a massive hiking trail in these areas, likely this would have been a group sent in for training, but then ran into this thing, which also does have some merit as they were there for a reason. I can't help but think with an animal being vulnerable to a Jeep, a live ammo situation with Marines would have brought it down. But it should be noted, there are bases right next to the open woods in this area. And this thing definitely doesn't belong naturally in this ecosystem. In fact, nothing about Connecticut's ecosystem would inspire the adaptations that we see in the animal up to and including the intelligence displayed. So I see two options. The first thing is that this is an experiment, a splicing of animal genetic coatings, possibly in a chimera scenario where human DNA is added to others to create a creature to be used in combat. Something that is stronger than a human and has a fair amount of intelligence that can seek out enemies that may even have barricaded themselves in to test defenses. Something may have gone wrong leading to the creature's escape. After it's escaped, or several of their escapes, because if other humans were to ignore the level of intellect these creatures are displaying, then it's entirely possible that the military regarded them as just mere animals. This is also supported by the fact that nobody shows up to help. If everyone who ends up at this cabin is calling for help and 911 never shows, nor do the park rangers, then they may have been ordered to stay their hand and avoid the area by the military until they get these things under control. Otherwise, 911 shouldn't have innate knowledge of these creatures in the area and should be sending out at least a few squad cars in order to locate the people who are missing. The second option is this thing is definitely not from Earth, although I have a difficult time believing this. 
It may have actually crashed in the area and the deforestation and cutting of trees is really just a cover for something having landed out there and the area isn't safe. If this is the case, then the military would immediately respond in way more force than they have. And this is why I don't believe it. After a group goes missing in the woods, investigating potentially a meteorite scenario, the whole area would have been blocked off as it's combed through to find these creatures. Which, by the way, if you'd like to know the difference between a meteor and a meteorite, a meteorite has the right stuff to reach the ground. A meteor burns up in the atmosphere. But anyhow, because this is not the case and the area wasn't blocked off, and the hair that this creature possesses, which appears to be homegrown mammalian traits, it seems like me, the animal, is definitely something that was created in a Chimera project and is either being actively tested or had inadvertently managed to escape its confines. But because there are several of them that made it out, to me, it seems like it's a test being conducted to understand the prowess. But I want to hear what you guys think. Think it's an alien? Naturally homegrown? Or are you 100% correct in believing that this is an experiment conducted by the military? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed, leaving a like would be fantastic and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. Again, check to see if you're still subscribed. I just have seen definitely, um, yeah, <laughs> there's some, some nonsense going on. But I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel links in the description if anybody's interested in that. I'd also like to thank my patrons real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronauts, Aegis and It's Not a Spoon. Thank you guys for your continued support. Seriously. Next up, it's our scientist, comically large spoon, Travis Ray and Zaluki. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping things running, and it's greatly appreciated. All right, so I hope it didn't sound like total crap. Uh, I feel like total crap, but that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and we'll see y'all in the next one.